Hello, and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, and I'm an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Waste Less Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has the goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoor starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. In episode 97 of the Outdoor Minimalist podcast, we are diving into a world that is a bit foreign to me, but has fascinated me for a long time. Wildlife photography. Many listeners likely enjoy photography as a hobby or maybe even as a profession that they've done for different lengths of time throughout their lives. This artistic pursuit is one way that we can spend time in nature and we can get to know the world a bit more intimately. But why are we talking about photography on this show? Minimalism in the world of photography is a topic that is brushed over rather easily and often. So when I was approached by Daniel J. Cox for this episode idea, I was intrigued by several concepts, such as the evolution of photography over the last few decades, the trend of minimalism in both gear and as an artistic concept, and how doing less can sometimes lead to a more efficient process. Daniel J. Cox has been documenting the world of nature for over four decades. His work has appeared in National Geographic magazine and many other publications related to conservation issues. He was recently awarded the Environmental Impact Award from the North American Nature Photographers Association, and he's firmly committed to scaling down, which includes the equipment he uses to produce his work. So thanks for joining me today, Daniel. Um, Photography is a topic that I know very little about, so I am eager to learn a little bit more about it from your experiences and just your life in general. So before we get like deep into the interview, I would also just like to get to know you a little bit better. So how did Mm -hmm. you first take an interest in outdoor recreation and how did photography start to make its way into those experiences? Yeah, good questions. Um, You know, I I was very fortunate, had a had a father who um, was an avid outdoorsman for all his life. We I grew up in Spokane, Washington, originally. And and we had lots of opportunities for really as a as a as a young boy, my father was a hunting and hunter and fisherman. And that's how I got into it as far as as getting involved in the outdoors. I started very young, following my father into the into the woods um, and uh, on excursions with my cousins and other family members hunting and fishing. And that's what really got me interested in in the outdoors and wanting to do more. The photography part of it, excuse me, the photography part of it was uh, really just kind of came accidentally. My dad enjoyed photography, but he, you know, he was raising five children. And so he really didn't have the ability to spend as much money on photography as he would have really liked to. But he did have a camera that he used um, now and again. and, and And I got exposed to photography from that perspective. And, um, and it was, it was that introduction of, of seeing dad use that camera that kind of stirred the interest in me. Um, but I was very young. That Those were in the days I was probably six, seven years old, and it didn't really gel for me until I was about 16 years old. Uh, when I remember watching a TV show and I don't remember what it was, but they were developing, black and white prints in the dark room and I watched these things come up and it was like magic to see this piece of paper go into this chemical and these guys you know swirling it around and all of a sudden you see these this this view of of an of an image come up and that's what really inspired me um to think I wanted to maybe try this a little more so that's what got me started um my dad still had the camera that I saw as a young boy, and he let me use it around the house. Um, but you know, I started asking him, "Hey, Dad, can I take this to school? I want to, I want to start photographing some of my schoolmates and whatever." He said, "You know, it's an expensive, it's an expensive piece of equipment. If you want to take it to school, you got to buy your own." So, my sister and I had a 1968 GTO 
that I was never a car guy. And I don't know why I had, we had a car like that, but anyway, it wasn't doing really well. I wish I had that car today. I'd make a lot of money on it, but we sold it for a thousand dollars. I took my 500 and she took her 500 and I bought a camera and the rest is kind of history. Wow. That's really cool. I mean, it's always amazing when you have that early exposure and how impactful <laughs> that can really be in just all of your experiences and development. And that just kind of carries through your life. And so from the early days as a teenager, like you just decided then that you were going to be a professional photographer or what happened after that? Did you go to school or did you develop it naturally? You know, it all came pretty natural, although I, I didn't go to school. Well, I started, I went to the University of Minnesota Duluth um, and, and, and started out as a major in communications. So it kind of tied in with photography, although I really didn't even really understand, you know, I eventually figured out that communications meant, you know, maybe sitting in a TV studio or working for a big corporation. And I went, I don't think I want to do that. So, um, but the photography end of it, as I, as I now, you know, have gotten into my occupation that, Kind of started, I was 16 years old when I first started wanting to seriously take pictures. Um, but it never dawned on me till, I don't know, maybe 18 to 19 that, God, this, you know, people actually make a living doing this stuff. Uh, it was really just, it, it, and when I started taking pictures, it all tied into basically what was in my backyard. I lived on a little small hobby farm in northern Minnesota. We had a lot of white-tailed deer in the area, grouse, things that I, you know, would I, I when I was tromping around in the field when I was hunting on the weekends, I'd see these things that I decided I wanted to try and get their picture instead of, you know, I mean, during hunting, you know, you can't hunt all year long. And not to mention, I started feeling like I'd really like to just get their picture as opposed to, you know, take them home physically. So um, so that's how it kind of, you know, that's and it, it never really dawned on me in the early days that I wanted to do anything with my photography other than tie other than how it was related to the outdoors and and the and and outdoor recreation type things. Eventually, I came to realize, wow, you know, if you wanted to make any money at it, the guys that were shooting in studios and weddings and all that kind of thing were the guys making money. Although I did start to it did start to occur to me that I could I. There was an industry that that you could actually photograph white-tailed deer, and in particular white-tailed deer, um, and sell those pictures to magazines that that purchased them, and make make a living at it. And it was even in those days, it was very difficult to make a living at it. But there was an avenue to do it. You had to work really hard and be a good marketer, and um, and you could actually make a living at it. Those days are gone, which we can talk about a little bit later, but uh, that's kind of how I got inspired to start doing it. But as a kid, you know, between 16 and 18, I started realizing that that it was the studio stuff that made people money. And I had a great um, opportunity in the city of Duluth. We had a studio called Grand Mason Studios. Um, I just about broke Dan's door down. His name was Dan Grand Mason, trying to get a job with him. And I finally got a job, literally. And I told him, I'll sweep floors. And and um, that's how I started. I started sweeping floors. And then I started doing darkroom work. And eventually, he trained me how to be a wedding photographer. And wedding photography, although it's kind of a tough job, um, you know, I had a really good teacher. And when you get into it, like, let's say you get into wedding photography all on your own, where you don't have somebody helping you understand what, how, what and how to do it. It's very stressful. It's stressful even when you really know what you're doing. But to have that mentor, uh, you know, take you under their wing and, and, and show, you, show you the ropes. So through college, I, put my, I literally put myself through college on my own, um, drove a brand new Toyota Silica. Worked on weekends. We did as many as three weddings a weekend. So I had I made good money as a kid and um, really enjoyed you know working for this this these two good gentlemen uh, Dan Grand Mason and my my good buddy Tim Slattery who passed away you know several years ago but good friends and great mentors and 
couldn't have done it without them. Yeah, absolutely. Having those mentors, especially early on in a profession like that, I feel like is invaluable. And yeah. I mean, from 16 until now, you have been taking photos. Obviously, what you're taking photos of has kind of like changed. Um, and yeah. also probably how you take those photos has potentially shifted some as well. So I am interested to hear kind of through your life experience in this field, how have things evolved and changed within the industry? And you can talk about like photography in general or just wildlife photography, whatever you're most comfortable with. Yeah, you know, really my my specialty is wildlife and nature, but I, you know, in the beginning we talk as as we started out your the conversation was you know how you get go how I got going in this. Um, you know, all the time, all those days that I was working for Grand Mason Studios, I was dreaming that I wanted to be a natural history photographer. Um, and so I started down that trail uh, while a, a, after I got out of school, I started down that trail um, and 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 then started building a career working with magazines, book publishers, calendar companies, stock agencies, all the all the organizations that uh, use use pictures of wildlife and nature. Now, in those days, it was stock photography, what we called stock photography, which meant that there were very few assignments. They, you literally, I would just go out and, and at the time, white-tailed deer were a bread, what I call a bread and butter subject. A lot of the hunting magazines purchased them. Um, and I grew up, like I said, hunting and fishing. So those were common, to, that was a common uh, potential market to me. I eventually, again, I got away from it because I'm not a big fan of hunting anymore. But um, it was the way for me to get started and, and actually making money, uh, taking pictures of wildlife and nature and and being able to have a way to get, you know, receive income of some sort to help me continue to do that. So um, so that's what started my my direction down the path of wildlife and, and nature. Um, but things have changed. And, you know, so for about 35 years, uh, I was able to earn a living taking picture of taking pictures in from from a stock perspective, which meant I went out, I produced all the images on my own budget uh, with a few assignments here and there. But the world of wildlife and nature is because it's a lot of fun and it's a very interesting um, you know, a, a specialty, you don't get a lot of people paying you to go out and do it. They expect, well, you like to do it, you know, go out there and get pictures and we'll see if we like some of them and we might pay you. That's a tough way to make a living. And I did it that way for 35 years. So, uh, but as time went on, um, uh, the internet technology and the photography in the camera, you know, in, in the cameras that we use today and, um, uh, you know, really the mainly the internet helped just completely destroy the ability to earn a living taking stock pictures. Uh, a lot of it had to do with back when I was a kid and I was going to college, one of the things that I would do every year, I would take a, a one week for New York and one week for Washington, DC. And I would fly there as a 21 year old kid. And I did it through about 10 years from my twenties on. 20s to my 30s, and I would go and knock on doors of publishers that I wanted to work with and show my portfolio. And that was kind of unusual for, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of photographers, I should say, never really understood that marketing was such a huge part of, of making a living at it. And going to meet these people was marketing. And that really, really helped me establish myself then as the internet came along, um, the the need to go do that and the ability, the the need for the publisher to get an advantage of you going to do that evaporated. They no longer had to wonder, um, you know, who could, who could they could get polar bear pictures from. They knew that if they typed in polar bears on the internet, boom, up comes thousands of polar bear pictures. And so that really, um, that really changed the dynamics of, of what was happening in the stock photography world and in particular wildlife and nature uh, because wildlife and nature is fun to go. It's, it's a lot of fun to go look for these things, photograph them, come home, put them up on Flickr, put them on your computer. Maybe you've got a website and still do your day job. And then when 
a magazine's looking for something and they type in polar bear and they see you've got some nice polar bear pictures on Flickr. Hey, would you be interested in letting us use one of these pictures? And most people who are not doing it professionally are willing to give their pictures away um, with very little return. You know, it used to be you could at least expect a credit line, but that doesn't happen much anymore either. And it's really a strange, it's, it's a strange, it's a strange deal because, uh, you know, people go out and they spend money on cameras, they spend money on travel, they spend money on, on um, you know, computers to deal with their pictures. And then somebody comes and asks them if they can use a picture and they go, yeah, you can use it. You can have it for free. Not good for business, but we, we evolved and we've, we've worked around it. And uh, maybe we can talk about that later on, but um, it's a, it was a crazy business and, and I enjoyed it for 35 years and we're now doing some other things and we can, we'll talk about some of those as well. Yeah. What would you say, um, kind of in like the same mindset of how things have changed, what would you say has really changed with the equipment that you use? Well, that's a good, that, that's, that's an interesting perspective because um, I, I've all, because of my love of wildlife and nature and the outdoors, I've always had a, uh, a burning desire to, to help the animals and the and the ecosystems and the places that I love, I'm I'm hoping that they will always be here um, for the rest of my life and for generations to come. I've I've studied this stuff enough to know that that's not guaranteed, and and we see it every day in our everyday lives. Uh, you know, climate change is such a big driving factor right now that's affecting all of us. So this this desire to have as little impact on the things that I come in contact with in the outdoors and in my life um, is drives me to always want to reduce and uh, reduce the reduce the my impact on whatever it might be, uh, which includes in my mind. Uh, my my equipment that I use, the cars that I drive, all these things, the house that I live in, that my wife and I dramatically downsized 10, 12 years ago. Um, and so, so in the world of photography, that's all come to a head with a change in systems that I use. I, used, I shot Nikons for many, many years, all those 35 years of producing serious, my serious work. And as I saw the changes that were coming in the marketplace, um, as I got older and I didn't want to carry the equipment as, as the heavy equipment that I used to carry, um, but more importantly, seeing technology continue to improve where we get these amazing pictures from smaller and smaller systems. And today I'm now shooting the Olympus Micro Four Third system as well as my iPhone. Um, and you know, I, I, about two years ago, it really dawned on me, people, there were lots of, you know, professional photographers are notorious for kind of looking down at the iPhone, but I teach a lot. And, um, and many of my students, you know, were so enthusiastic about their iPhones that I started really, really tr testing them myself. And, you know, Part of the problem that I had was I had a very old one and I finally migrated to a, one of the very you know newer models. And it really is astonishing what technology has done to help us reduce the size, the cost, the uh, uh, impact of, of these of these of, of the lenses and the cameras that I was shooting for you know decades as a professional. Um, and so you know, in the world of photography today, the three big players are Nikon, Canon, and Sony. And Sony is rel is relatively new on the scene. Back in the days when I was earning my livings, they really didn't even participate in the world of film. Which many maybe are, I'm guessing I'm guessing you know what film you do you know what a film it? Are you familiar with film, camera film? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I sometimes have to check, but uh, but we used to shoot film, right? And um, and in the days of film, uh, it was Nikon and Canon, and they built these really big, massive systems to help us accomplish getting professional pictures. 
And in those days, it was really essential. Um, but as time has moved on, they're still building these great big massive systems. But the iPhone is a perfect example of why we don't need them anymore. And we can reduce the size and uh, expense of, of um, using this equipment and help bring everything down to a more minimal uh, package when we're traveling and, and, uh, and, and not having to spend as much money on the equipment that we buy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, for someone like me, just I like taking photos to like preserve memories, that type of thing, right, not necessarily right, yep. to sell or put up or anything. Right. And so an iPhone is completely fine for my purposes. But if you were to use the minimalist approach um, as a professional photographer or even someone who's trying to enter photography as a living um, and career, how would you apply that mindset when you're deciding how to yeah. shoot something? Well, first of all, you 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 make a dis like in the let's take my my um my genre, which is wildlife and nature. Um there's it's very helpful to have a smaller, more compact system because one, I travel a lot, it's easier to get on airplanes, it doesn't weigh as much, you don't have as many problems with the you know, the uh airlines getting your equipment on the planes, um, because you generally want to take it on with you as carry on because you don't want to check that expensive gear if if, if you've got the professional stuff um in in the world that i shoot in the micro four, it's called micro four thirds micro four thirds is just a category of cameras it would it's kind of a it's hard to kind of explain there's f what we call full frame systems which is the nikon canon and sony and then you have some of those smaller systems which are micro four thirds and what is called aps-c cameras those all relate to the size of the sensor um, and the size of the sensor that captures the image is e it, you would equate to, let's say, the size of film. Film sensors today are what film used to, or I should say, uh, yes, sensors today are what film used to be. So the bigger piece of film, you, you, you may remember pictures in old books where photographers were using cameras. They called them eight by tens that had, you know, the camera backs, the old pictures from the 1800s. They had, they were shooting negatives, literally eight by 10 inches in, in size. And then that came down to five by seven inches. That was a, that was a smaller camera. And then it came down to medium format, which is about two by three inches. And then we had what we used for many, many years, 35 millimeter, Nikon, Canon, Sony's. And now it's gone down to what I call the, what, what is the category of micro four thirds in the digital world, which is smaller than 35 millimeter film. So it just keeps on reducing in size. And, and that's very cool uh, uh, for the benefit of uh, some of the benefits I mentioned earlier of smaller size, more compact equipment and less expensive, a lot less expensive. Um, so when you think about all these things, you have to, in the world of natural history, one of the benefits of having a smaller system is the ability to walk through the woods, hike up the trails, climb the mountain with a smaller, more compact system that's going to give you really high quality images. The smaller the sensor and in and the iPhone is included in this. This iPhone has the same technology. It's a little tiny sensor in there. And in fact, it's much smaller than the equipment I use. So if you go from an iPhone to, let's say, Micro Four Thirds, the Olympus system or the Panasonic Lumix system, you gain a tenfold size increase in the size of that sensor, which the bigger the sensor, technically, the better the quality of the image. All right. So... That's part of the reason there's still 35 millimeter size sensors. They do perform even a little bit better in some situations. But in today's, in today's world, I personally feel like you have to decide what is enough. And for a lot of people, the iPhone is enough. But if you're going to go to Africa, let's say you decide, you know, you love the outdoors and you're, you've decided you want to do a, a once in a lifetime trip to Africa, um, you're going to definitely be shorthanded with an iPhone. They just don't, you know, to get pictures of the beautiful leopards or maybe not a giraffe, they're huge, <laughs> but, but let's say a leopard or um, uh, some of the smaller animals um, like the... Uh, 
uh, the mongoose, some of the mongoose or some of the smaller monkeys. You can't get close enough to them with an iPhone. And a lot of people will zoom in with their iPhone. And the downside to that is that when you're zooming in with an iPhone, if you're on the, the longest lens they have, which is they have the, the three, three X, they call it, that's a little bit of a telephoto, but what you're really doing is you're just zooming into the picture that's already there. And so you're basically cropping it as it goes down. And the smaller you make that picture, the less quality you have for hanging it on the wall. If you decide that it's really a beautiful image and you want to you want to have it on the wall of your your home. Yeah. So so okay. um anyway, so long story about the different size sensors. So basically what I've done is I've reduced the size of my camera gear by going with a medium size sensor when it's compared to an iPhone or the full the great big full frame cameras that we that most professionals use today. Um so yeah and and it's it's been it's been so much fun. Um it's been less expensive and uh the technology just keeps on bringing the prices and the size of this stuff down, down, down. And we're going to have, you know, they're talking about an iPhone next year that's going to have even more of a telephoto on it. I still don't think it's going to be enough to really accomplish what I get. I'm able to get with these these cameras that I use. But, you know, the lines are blurring. And and at some point, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I've learned in all my years now never to say never. So, yeah, and if we're looking at minimalism from, I guess, multiple perspectives in the world of photography, do you ever feel like um, less is more in terms of when you're taking photos? Because I have heard like take as many photos like as possible because then you have a higher chance of having like a good one. Or is it more so kind of like up to your discretion in identifying? when it is appropriate to that's that's a great something. that's a great question um you know i've never been one to the, even in the in the world of the professional photographers um i i i i've heard this so many times you know if i shoot 10,000 pictures and i get three good ones i'm happy and i think wow that's a lot of waste you know it's not quite as it's not like it used to be when we used to shoot film we, you know, when you're shooting digital, you're not, you're not wasting actual pixels. They come back, you know, you, you don't ever get rid of them. But I really do feel that, um, you know, I've, I tell my students, it's as important to know when to take a picture as, or I'm, I'm sorry, it's as important to know when not to take a picture as when to take a picture. Um, and yes, there are times where if just going along willy nilly shooting a few things, you might come up with an image or two. The the biggest benefit to that is the fact that you're kind of like warmed up. That's when something does happen, you're ready to hit the button on your iPhone. There was something that, you know, some sort of action that happened that boom, you hit the button at the right time. That's the biggest benefit to it. But, you know, it's, I feel it's wasteful. Um, it's wasteful in, in hard drive space and, in all kinds of things that even though you're not wasting film anymore, time looking at all these pictures, you know, these images that go up on the cloud. Um, it's one of the things that I struggle with, uh, with this whole cloud computing thing is the amount of, of, of electricity, the amount of storage, the amount of, of carbon that's been, you know, it gets put into the atmosphere because we're, we're just continually adding all this stuff electronically to, things that have to be powered by electricity. Um, so I'm a firm believer in being more, more specific about what you take pictures of. Um, there is the one thing, you know, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago is that as you shoot more, you do warm yourself up and you put yourself in a position to get better pictures because you're ready to push that button when something exciting happens. But in general, um, I, I, I really like to kind of analyze situations and decide, you know, I've shot, I mean, I, I've done it for so long. I know that that background with this foreground, 
this isn't going to work. It's, it just it just doesn't look good. But that does take time and effort to to develop that. And um, so you know, so if you want to think about keeping your idea of of doing things in as minimal way as possible, be a tough editor on yourself. Shoot that stuff. You're not wasting anything by shooting it, but don't don't keep it all. You know, go through your pictures. Um, look at them, get rid of the bad ones, keep a few of the, you know, keep the good ones for sure. Keep the ones that you're happy with, but the stuff that's junk, remember that it goes up to the cloud, especially if you're using an Apple product. Um, and that takes up space and takes up energy and something I'm not overly excited about. Yeah. I do think that it is often because it's not a tangible thing, right? The cloud isn't something yeah. that like we have and it doesn't, you're obviously not sending anything to a landfill or anything, but it is easy to forget that it still is using resources to store that data. And the same thing exactly. if you have so many emails in your email inbox, all of that is using resources. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I was kind of thinking while you were talking about like the equipment and gear, and I guess it's somewhat related to my other question, but is, do you think a lot of these same principles apply to videography as well? Or is it kind of like a different thing? No, altogether? It, it, no, it really does apply to videography. In fact, it might even be more um, impactful because um, video, video, videography has the, I don't know what, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I have kind of an idea, but you can get away with less quality in a video than you can with still photography. And it has a lot to do with the human, you know, a human sitting looking at a still image where they can pick it apart um, quality wise as you're just sitting there looking at it. Whereas video moves along and 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 brings your mind with it and takes takes you away from being able to really highly criticize it on quality. Um, and so video has even come down further in, in, in the size of the cameras and what we can do with them. Uh, the iPhone is a perfect example. I can't believe there's, there's things that I shoot with my iPhone and stills, um, uh, that, that I, 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 I may say to myself, okay, get the real camera out. This is a great image. We need, we need super high quality on this. But I've 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 only run into that situation for the stuff that I do video for, maybe one or two times with video where I I really saw the uh, issues that the iPhone was ha ha problems the iPhone was having, in you know produce, producing something really high quality in particular really low light, <clears throat> excuse me really low light situations. So. Um, so video is a perfect example of of uh, I, I'm I'm just astonished at what I see young people in particular doing with their video cameras and producing with their video cameras um, that we could have never gotten away with with in the in the world of still photography. But uh, you know, and that's another thing that's really important <clears throat> is is coming to coming to grips with and understanding what your where you're going to be showing your whatever you're producing, uh, what what it's going to be shown on. Um, if you're doing a great big beautiful art museum presentation with your photography, you're going to need really high quality uh, originals to work from to produce prints. You know, generally in a state in a, in a uh, situation like that, you're going to do prints at least 16 by 20 inches in size. All the cameras we shoot today do that with no problem. I'm doing I'm doing prints now, forty by sixty inches with these smaller cameras that I'm using, but a forty by sixty inch iPhone picture probably wouldn't cut it. And I say probably only because I've never tried it. I've not had the guts to try it. <laughs> but I would not be overly surprised if you know you could you could you could get away with it and 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 with some software techniques and whatever that you could you could improve the quality of that but yeah um video so part of the reason that the video guys and gals can get away with not having quite as much quality is because most of them are are presenting their work in a youtube format or on you know even i'm looking at a 27 inch IMAX screen, um, you know, it would still look beautiful. Uh, 
So it's really important to decide where you're going to be shooting. I mean, where you're going to be sharing this stuff and however you're going to be sharing it. And that has an effect on the quality of, of whatever it is uh, you might be, you, you decide to shoot with. Yeah, kind of knowing the intended use ahead of time before um, Perfect. just like that's, jumping in. That's succinct. That's much more <laughs> succinct. <than mine. laughs> exactly. I think about that a lot when I'm thinking about outdoor gear and like what you buy and always looking at the intended use first. So it's very related um, yeah. in my mindset. Yeah. So um, I guess you have already mentioned a few of these things that people would be able to have as takeaways um, from this conversation. But if you were to like put in a nice little package for aspiring photographers that would want to enter um, wildlife and nature photography or even mm -hmm. videography, um, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? Well, the first thing I say, and I get this question a lot. <laughs> I want to be a wildlife photographer. And the first thing I do is I say, okay, you can still do that, but you can't just be a photographer. Just photography anymore is gone. You cannot make a living at it. Um, you have to be what I call a multimedia artist, which means you have to know how to shoot sound or record sound. You have to be able to work with your video cameras and, and, and you're going to have to know how to, work with still photography as well. In fact, I've seen it already in many situations and professional situations that I know about where the videographers were actually hired first and then were required to figure out how to get stills from their video work. Never have I heard of a still photographer being hired first and then required to potentially shoot video and do a good job with producing a video afterwards. Now, I have heard of still photographers being hired where they do have to provide some basic clips, but um, I don't think, you know, you have to come into the business. It's it, The good news is, there's good news and bad news. The good news is there's still the ability to earn a living shooting cinematography with uh, for of wildlife and nature. Companies like National Geographic, the BBC, Apple is producing a 10-part series that sounds like it's, I know several guys that are working on it, that sounds like it's going to be amazing. It's going to be, you know, BBC world-class quality. Um, but, uh, but the magazine industry that I worked in for decades, um, them buying pictures enough to support you as a wildlife photographer is is completely gone. So if you do want to get into this business, I tell young people, you got to understand it's not just still photography. You can do that, but you have to learn how to run those video cameras as well. And even more important, you have to be able to sit down, take your materials, put them together and and become a, a, a an editor as well. Um, and, you know, all these things that I just described for for many years, I saw this train coming and I did not want to join it. I, 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 I was a, I was a still photographer. That's what I wanted to do. I remember when I was young, I knew that there were guys that were going the cinematography route. And I said, I love the still picture. There's something about that one individual frame. And so when I saw this train coming, I went, I was not happy. I was, I was, I was bitter about it for a long time until I started, you know, it was the, it was the phones that started to make me realize that when I shot a picture on the phone, they come up as little thumbnails, just like a still photo or a video. The only difference is you tap the video one and this little clip starts playing out. So when I looked at it, it was digital photography that really made me realize this isn't quite so bad. Um, you know, it actually, there are, I, I knew there were times, even as a still photographer, that there were times I kind of wished I could put this together as a moving series because a still by all, all by itself just didn't have the impact. So now I have the best of both worlds and it's so much fun because one of the advantages that we have as still photographers that get into video photography, into videography is that the Ken Burns effect allows us to use, I've got 1.5 million pictures on my hard drive that I use, that I'm sitting here across from my computer. And all those still pictures allow me to go into projects when I'm doing a little video. 
And in fact, some of your some of your listeners, if they go to our YouTube channel, you'll see many of them don't. Many people tell me they don't realize this, but they I incorporate still pictures with a video project on a regular basis because I might be going through something where I need to show a, a, a something for whatever it might be. And I wasn't able to get it on video, but I go, man, I got a lot of years of, you know, I've got a lot of loon pictures that I'm doing this loon piece. Let's, let's go grab some stills. So off I go, I grab these stills and with the Ken Burns effect um, in either Final Cut Pro or other programs that you might use, you can tie them into the, into the cinematography or in the videography. And so, and yet one of the cool things about that is that I don't know one cinematographer that thinks about going to a still library to do what I just talked about. So as a still photographers, we're being, you could say a little more cagey and going, you know, I'm going to work the, I'm going to work both these angles. And it's, it's really turned it into a lot of fun. Um, I was bitter about having to be a, a cinematographer for many years and, I finally realized this is actually kind of fun. And it's, there's, there's a, it's, it's, there's more creativity to the video project. You get to not only go out and shoot it like we did with still photography, but then you come home and there's sound, there's music, there's narration, there's putting these clips together. There's going out and looking at your still images, dropping some still images, and you get this whole, a major difference in creative capabilities with with videography that we didn't have a still with stills so the number one thing i tell them can't be a still photographer but that's okay you can still be a person because because why do we why do we want to be it what what, what do we want to do we want to be outside we want to be hanging out with the critters we want to be enjoying nature breathing the fresh air hiking up the trail camping building a fire we want to do all these things that we love in the outdoors and what I did was figured out a way to get myself into the outdoors. So one avenue as just a still photographer is gone, but cinematography is still there. That's awesome. That's great advice. And it is interesting to hear kind of your um, hesitancy, I guess, um, moving into that progression, um, mm -hmm. but coming around to it and seeing the positives is really great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you shared a lot of really, really great insights, and I learned a lot. Um, so I, I hope other listeners did too. Um, but how can those listeners learn more about you? Like you said, check out your YouTube channel and maybe see some of your work. Yeah. Well, you, the number one tool I kind of help people um, experience some of the stuff I do with is my website, which is naturalexposures.com. Um, that's plural. Uh, and then our YouTube channel is at Daniel J. Cox on YouTube. Um, you know, we have an Instagram account at Daniel J. Cox NE. So that's Daniel J. Cox Natural Exposures, just the just the two letter or characters at the end, NE. So those are all kind of ways that, you know, uh, we can we can we can connect with each other. Um, and you know, it's that's another thing that's kind of interesting that relates to getting your work out there and being published. I really did not partake in the social media for a number of years because I used to feel like, you know, I used to get paid to get to, to share this stuff. Well, I finally realized nobody's paying for this stuff anymore. So I might as well be the publisher. If I'm going to give my stuff away for free, then which is what the publishers want. Now I go, all right, well, I'm the publisher. I'll give it away for free for myself. <laughs> and that's what I do now. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't say, I don't know what I would do without social media um, and, and YouTube, uh, which has given me an outlet for the combination of stills and cinematography. Um, I don't know what I'd do with it. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't get, be getting published that much anymore. I still have clients, we still have clients that we work with, but nothing like what we did in the 80s and 90s and even up to 2010. But, um, but I'm, still, I'm still shooting as much as I ever, in fact, I'm shooting more. And, uh, you know, old dog, new tricks, I think they call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of those platforms, there's pros and cons to them, but I think when it comes to like producing images and videos, like you're saying, you have a little bit more creative control and that can be really, um, beneficial. <laughs> it is. That is true. You've got total creative control. Um, yeah. And it, it, it makes it fun. Uh, 
yeah, it's another way. It's just I look at it as another way of being published, uh, earning a living at it. It's, you know, a little different story. I do hear of some of the influencers that make money at it, and there are some of those out there. But um, yeah, it's it's just a it's just a different way to do it. For sure. Well, thanks again for jumping on and yeah, um, sharing from all of your <laughs> your years and years of experience in this field. Well. My, it's my pleasure, Meg. It's nice to meet you. And um, yeah, thanks for the chance to share my story. And, uh, you know, if you ever have any questions on photography, you got any listeners that are wondering about it, just uh, re reach out and I'm happy to share whatever I've got. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book on YouTube, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter at theoutdoorminimalist.com. For even more updates, other educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with the shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.